Welcome everybody to today's session on health and climate change. How can tackling climate change improve your health? COP26 ended last week with a combination of frustration and small but significant wins. For the health community, having worked through the pandemic whilst keenly aware of the climate crisis as a greater public health threat, the absence of health at the centre of the COP negotiations felt a stark omission. However, despite a lack of centrality, health was still represented with a greater presence and impact than previous years. Through a WHO health pavilion, a commitment from over 50 health systems to achieve carbon neutrality, and a number of actions by doctors and medical students. What we increasingly know, in part through the research contribution of our panelists today, is that while climate change is a great threat to public health, tackling climate change offers many public health benefits, which we'll be exploring in our session. This panel is convened as part of UCL's climate campaign, Generation One. Together with the new generation taking responsibility for climate action and turning science into actionable ideas. We welcome you to join Generation One, which you can do in a number of easy ways. You can pledge your climate action and check out our new Generation One podcast. And both of these can be found at ucl.ac.uk forward slash generation dash one. And you can tweet from this event using the hashtag UCL Generation One. Today, we're going to be hearing from four speakers and there's going to be time at the end for questions. These can be submitted by going to Slido, which is sli.do, and entering the event code hashtag UCL Climate. My name is Dr. Rita Issa and I'm chairing our session today. I'm a research fellow in climate change, migration and health at the UCL Institute for Global Health. I'm a part-time East London GP and I'm a long-time climate activist. And it's my pleasure to bring together such a wealth of experience and insight in our panelists. So first, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Marina Romanello, who is the research director for the Lancet Countdown, tracking progress on health and climate change. She coordinates the research activities of the Lancet Countdown collaboration, and she's in charge of the scientific development and refining of Lancet Countdown's indicators. Then we're going to be hearing from Professor Ilan Kelman, who is Professor of Disasters and Health at UCL. Ilan is also a professor at the University of Agda in Kristiansand and is using climate change as one connection between disasters and health. Professor Jenny Mindel is a public, um, sorry, <laughs> is a professor of public health at UCL. She is an international expert on the impacts of transport and health and inequalities. And last but not least, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Geisha Hübner, who is a lecturer in sustainable and healthy built environments at the Bartlett School of Environment, Energy and Resource. Her research and teaching focuses on the links between the built environment, energy, climate change and health. So without further ado, we're going to hand over to Marina. Thank you, Rita. I'm hoping you can see my slides now. Um, and thank you so much for that introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, at this lecture today. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a bit about the work that the Lancet Countdown does and give you an overview of the health impacts of climate change and why tackling climate change could be the biggest global health opportunity of the 21st century. Um, but before we start, what are the health impacts of climate change? Why do we say that climate change is the biggest global health risk, uh, um, global health risk of the 21st century? This is a very complex slide, so I don't intend for you to go through the whole lot of it. But as you can see here, climate change through the changes in the, um, in the environmental conditions and the clim climatic conditions is affecting through extreme weather events our health directly. And it's also starting to undermine the um, environments and, and the, the natural social systems that sustain our health. And as such, through many interconnected pathways, it's undermining um, our health by um, jeopardizing the food that we eat, the air we breathe, the water that we depend on, and by directly exacerbating um, uh, chronic conditions and undermining social determinants of health as well. Um, it's also changing the environmental um, suitability for infectious disease transmission and affecting our health both directly and indirectly. And what's really important to note is that all of the effects of climate change on our health will be deeply dependent on and seeped by 
our social mediating factors, the social systems that sustain our health, our health systems, our education, our capacity to adapt and respond uh, to climate change risks. The work that we do at the Lancet Countdown nucleates over 120 researchers from around the world, over 43 academic and UN agency institutions all around the globe to produce evidence that to track the health impacts of climate change and to track what are the health implications of the world's response to climate change. And as you can see here on the screen, the Lancet Countdown has been producing uh, annual reports that are published in the medical journal, The Lancet. Um, and we clearly have six iterations of reports, with the big one that you see here being our latest report. In these reports, we have over 44 indicators tracking progress in health and climate change. And our latest report throws a very stark message, that is that it launches a code red for a healthy future. That's the title of our latest report. And it's the case because we're seeing that climate change is really starting to um, worsen all of the health determinants that we're measuring through our impact indicators. So when we think about climate change impacts on health, the first thing that comes to mind is exposure to extremes of heat. Heat waves are not only very uncomfortable, they're actually silent killers. They're particularly dangerous for people over 65 years of age, very young uh, children under one year of age, and those living with underlying health conditions like chronic heart disease, respiratory disease. And um, throughout last year, particularly in the northern summer, we've seen record heat waves in the northwest USA, in Canada, Sicily heat almost 50 degrees, Russia, Kazakhstan. And we're seeing these heat waves becoming more and more intense all around the world. As you can see here, the exposure of vulnerable populations, people over 65 years of age, to heat waves has been increasing really rapidly since the 80s, and particularly so in the last about 10 years. And what is important to note is that now we do have um, scientific evidence through the textual attribution studies that can pin down climate change as being a critical factor that made these heat waves worse, or heat waves that would have been virtually impossible without the anthropogenic, um, uh, uh, the human caused climate change. So we know now that it's anthropogenic activity causing these extreme events and putting our health at risk and exacerbating underlying health conditions. However, heat not only affects us through morbidity uh, and mortality increases, but also through undermining the social determinants of health. We know that there's physiological limits towards how much work we can do uh, under, under really hot weather, and it puts our health uh, at increasing risk. What we're also tracking is the number of potential work hours lost as a result of extreme heat exposure around the world. And we estimate in 2020, almost 300 billion hours of potential work were lost due to the extreme temperature. But what I want you to look at here is that when we look at what this uh, means for countries with different levels of human development index, it is the countries with the low and the medium human development index that see the biggest proportion of their labor loss happening in the agricultural sector. This means that their most vulnerable workers and those that um, they rely on for food productivity are the ones that are seeing the biggest impacts of climate change um, through undermining the, their work capacity. And in the low human development index country group, this would have contributed to around four to eight percent of the GDP loss as a result of the loss of income. So heat is also affecting the social determinants of health, um, people's livelihoods and their capacity to bring bread to the table. And with increasing temperatures and increasing um, drought events, we're also seeing that the potential to produce food is also decreasing. The crop yield potential for the all major staple crops that we're tracking, maize, winter wheat, spring wheat and soybean has gone down uh, over the past years, since particularly since the 80s. And we're seeing reductions from three to 6% in, in crop productivity potential. And we're also tracking drought events that obviously also undermine food productivity. We reached records of about 20% of the land area at any one point being in extreme drought uh, events. And again, we have detection attribution studies that are showing that areas that are particularly hit by drought impacting on food security um, those drought events have to do with anthropogenic climate change as well. And as I said before, as um, the temperature changes, precipitation patterns change, humidity changes, so do just the um, environmental suitability for the transmission of major infectious diseases. And what you can see here is the environmental suitability for the transmission of dengue, that is a leading cause of serious illness and death 
in Asian and Latin American countries. And we're seeing that the potential of transmission for dengue around the world has increased seven or 13%, depending on the vector, since the 1950s. And the biggest increases with almost 45% increase um, we saw in the Americas, and a, a region that is particularly uh, hit by high incidence of dengue, where it's a very big public health concern. So climate change also making these conditions worse. And with this kind of multi-hit scenario, it's really important that uh, countries prepare their health systems and strengthen their health systems to be able to cope with these increased health risks. However, when we look at what countries are doing in terms of implementing the national health emergency frameworks, which are frameworks that will enable countries to cope with any sort of health risks and health emergencies, such as a COVID pandemic or a multi-hit scenario from climate change impacts, countries are really not doing enough to implement and to strengthen their uh, health systems and their emergency response. Only 75% of countries around the world reported medium to high level of implementation of a national health emergency framework in 2020. But what is more, more striking is that if we look at what this means in terms of human development index country group, the very high human development index countries have reached uh, on average 90% of implementation of the national health emergency frameworks. But the most vulnerable countries, those with low and medium levels of human development index, have only reached about 50% of implementation. So very big differences in the way countries are getting prepared to adapt and to respond to health emergencies. And obviously, it won't be enough to adapt to climate change. We also need to mitigate. We know that there's limits to adaptation. When we look at the energy systems, this is the biggest contributor to, clean, uh, to greenhouse gas emissions, but also a big contributor to air pollution that affects our health. It's really important that energy systems start decarbonizing. But as you can see in this black line here, the global energy system has not decarbonized almost at all since the 70s. The carbon intensity, that is the, unit, the amount of CO2 emitted per unit of energy produced, has remained fairly static. And what is interesting is that the countries with high level of human development index are starting to decarbonize their energy system because they can afford the technology, because they can afford that shift. However, at the current rate of decarbonization around the world, it would take us about 150 years to fully decarbonize, which is absolutely incompatible, obviously, with the, the Paris Agreement. But again, we look at the energy system because it has to do with um, climate change, but also because it has to do with one of the biggest co-benefits of decarbonization delivering cleaner air. And when we look at what's happening with air pollution, mortality due to the most harmful forms of air pollution, PM2.5 uh, particulate air pollution, was at about 3.3 million deaths per year in 2019, and it's barely shifted since 2015. And what is important to note here is that one third, almost a million of those deaths, were directly related to the burning of fossil fuels. And again, I said before, it is the very high human development index countries that are starting to decarbonize their energy systems. And with tighter air, uh, air quality measures, they are in, in comparison having less deaths per 100,000 inhabitants than countries with medium and high levels of human development index, whose economies are still developing um, based on fossil fuel industries. And these countries are not really uh, being able to enjoy that health co benefit of faster decarbonizations. And one thing that is not visible here, because we're talking about ambient air pollution, is the huge burden of indoor air pollution, particularly in low human development index countries, where many people still rely on biomass or, or other dirty sources of fuel for cooking, for heating, and particularly in the home. So transitioning away from fossil fuel really has an enormous potential for saving lives in terms of reducing air pollution and, and cleaning our airs. And yet, with all of these harms from fossil fuels and with all of these harms from climate change, 77% of the 84 countries that we looked at were still subsidizing fossil fuels in 2018. This is if we take into account all of their subsidies, all of their carbon taxes, the 77% still uh, designated funds from taxpayers' money towards subsidizing and promoting fossil fuel consumption. And what's even more worrying is that most of the countries were still subsidizing fossil fuels to percentage, percentages that were comparable to the total health budget, over 50%, even reaching 300% uh, of the total health budgets. And this is quite an unacceptable situation if we take into account all the negative externalities for health of fossil fuel burning. So we are at a position now in which we can 
try to make this transition. As uh, Rita said, COP has been fairly disappointing towards uh, enabling that change. But if we uh, and all countries were determined to um, designate these funds towards activities that promote health and promote a low carbon transition, we could really tilt the balance. So with that, I'm just going to close and invite you to listen that, to visit lancetcandom.org, where we have a bit more data and you can explore more indicators at a country level if, if you wish to. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Marina. Uh, you've really laid out the, the groundwork and the basic understanding of how, how health is so impacted by climate and some of the ways in which action on climate change can really start to address some of those challenges. I've had a look at the Slido um, and we would really like to welcome any of your questions for our panelists. So please do head over to Slido and submit your questions there. Um, just a little reminder, you can do that. Just Google Slido and the codes to be able to access is uh, UCL Climate. And also please do tweet. Uh, the hashtag is uh, hashtag climate UCL or hashtag uh, generation, UCL generation one. And next, we're going to be heading over to Ilan. So Ilan, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be looking at the health impacts of migration and disasters under climate change. And unfortunately, as expected, it's not easy. So please do, as mentioned, tweet and use Instagram. Please connect with me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, because we need your input. We need to understand what is needed and what the issues are. In particular, when considering the, how climate change affects migration and health, not just health, we found that it was almost impossible to attribute people moving due to climate change impacts. There are plenty of examples and estimates. The numbers go from 50 million to 1 billion people affected, but all of them fell apart when we looked closely. The only one withstanding scrutiny so far is about a dozen villages in Alaska who have spent 20 years talking about moving several kilometers inland due to eroding shorelines. And this is almost definitely due to climate change only, but they remain in the same country, so they cannot be called climate change refugees. In fact, by international law, we can only be refugees if we cross an international border for specific political or social reasons. No one can claim refugee status for climate, climate change or environmental topics. So until the definition of refugee is changed, we know exactly how many climate refugees we have zero and we can predict the future exactly because this number will remain zero. Climate change migrants are perhaps different. Some low-lying islands are gaining land from climate change induced sea level rise, some are eroding. So by about 2080 or 2100, we should know the expected extent of the oceans rising, before that perhaps the acidity increasing. And these may have the potential to wipe out coastlines and settlements, possibly leading to a lot of migration over coming centuries. We do have scenarios where countries go underwater, but it is not imminent. Uh, nonetheless, we should start planning now because it takes a long time to move a country and it may happen over decades or it might not. It is complicated. And to understand these climate change and migration links, it is so important to look at the science, not our social media feed or newspaper headlines, even though we encourage you to engage with us on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. We next need to examine migration impacting health. Physical health and mental health might improve by being a migrant if health systems are robust and we take care of people. In that case, fleeing to a peaceful country can improve a person's health overall. So migration itself does not necessarily lead to specific health outcomes, positive or negative, because it depends on how we treat migrants and the state of our health systems. This is our choice. And people, of course, are different. Norway, for example, settles refugees throughout the country. And Marina mentioned drought in Somalia. So Norway takes Somalis who trek to cross the desert to escape and plunks them down above the Arctic Circle, where they need to learn what snow is, 
and deal with 24 hours of winter darkness. Some love and thrive in it. How can you not be awed by the aurora's majesty? Others have difficulty. If the health system is there for us, if it treats us as human beings, then no matter what our first language or skin color, we might be fine. If not, then yes, self-harm and suicide do happen. But to, to all Norwegians, whether they are ex Somalis or born in Norway, we, not the climate, make choices regarding how we deal with people and their health, our health, migrants or not. Including people affected by disasters, which does cover conflict, but not all disasters are conflict related. Disasters are actually not caused by the weather, but by us building, not building for or not living with the weather. Look at Western Canada over the past week. They built highways through a river valley, farms on a drained lake, and a city on a delta. It does not matter what climate change is doing to the weather. You build in a floodplain, you're going to get wet. If we put a road by an unstable slope, it slips away and we see the consequent health impacts. We don't necessarily need to say, oh, it wasn't a robust health system. When people built in places they know have floods and landslides. The standard mantra is that there is no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothing. Some people cannot afford good clothing or they do not have access to it. They may not have the knowledge or the impetus or the support to get an umbrella or good clothing. So if we support people in dealing with the weather, then we're not going to have weather disasters. No matter what the weather, we could avoid, avoid disasters by giving people the opportunities and resources to deal with rain, wind, water, drought, tornadoes, and storms but not everyone can afford insurance. They may not have knowledge about floodplains or landslide runout areas, or they choose perfectly rationally not to evacuate when they know the weather is coming in because they lack transport or they cannot afford to take a day off work, they'll be fired for it. Or they fear harassment and assault while evacuating or in the emergency shelter. We create disasters, no matter what the weather, and no matter how climate change impacts the weather. For disasters, as with migration, any health impacts come from how we treat people and how we treat our health systems. The links from climate change to migration and disasters, and then to health, are tenuous at best. Except, Human-caused climate change is pushing heat humidity into regimes beyond human survival. Sure, we could have 24 seven cooling and stay indoors for three months. Uh, thank you, we did that during lockdown and who wants to do that every year? Besides, as always, some people do not have this choice. Agricultural and construction workers will have a choice, either die in the climate change induced heat humidity or do not work and lose their jobs. And this has knock-on effects on our food supplies and materials. Marina, at, Marina actually mentioned this very clearly, showing the devastation to outdoor workers and how that is going to impact us directly from heat and humidity. Climate change heat humidity is with us now. It will soon make large swaths of land effectively uninhabitable especially where it does not cool down sufficiently at night so that we can recover from the heat stress, heat and humidity stress during the day. This is a terrifying aspect now from human caused climate change. And we do expect to see migration, disasters and substantial adverse health impacts, mental and physical, including in London, just imagine 45 degrees on the tube coming directly from human-caused climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. 
I always really value your framing of climate change and disasters as human systems failures, uh, the flip side of which means that mitigating the worst impacts of climate change is very much a human responsibility and a systems responsibility. Um, and now I would love to introduce uh, Jenny as our third speaker. Thank you. So, good afternoon. I'm going to be talking about climate change mitigation and the co-benefits for health of active travel. So transport's very important because of all the benefits it brings us for health. It, it provides access to goods, to services, to people, to jobs, to education. It provides access to green and blue spaces and ideally we would be traveling through these where possible perhaps alongside more often than in or on water. And it also gives plenty of opportunity for physical activity. But there are many harms from transport. In addition to the carbon emissions, there's also emissions of many other air pollutants that, as Marina mentioned, noise pollution, community severance, which is where either transport infrastructure or the volume and or speed of traffic on busy roads makes it difficult or impossible to get across to the other side and therefore you don't have all the benefits of access. Injuries, sedentary behaviour, tarmac causing heat islands and uh, toxic runoff uh, contaminating water, for example. So we've already heard from Marina about uh, CO2 emissions. So the, these are two pie charts showing the proportion coming of global greenhouse gas emissions coming by different economic sectors. On the left um, is globally, and you can see that worldwide transport accounts for 14% of carbon emission, of greenhouse gas emissions. In the USA in 2015, it was 27%, almost double the global uh, proportion. Now this is for the UK, and here the black pie slice shows uh, CO2 emissions from transport. And you can see that over time, this has been increasing as a proportion of the whole. And of course, that could be increasing because it is rising or because everything else is falling. Well, this is some of the main causes of CO2 emission from transport in the UK. And you can see that overall, it has been falling from 1970 to 2012. Brown shows business total, that's falling. And purple shows the energy supply, and that's falling not as much, but it is definitely coming down. However, in black, you can see the transport. So the answer is it's rising both in absolute uh, terms and as a proportion of the whole. But as well as CO2 emissions, there are also other air pollutants, as Marina again mentioned in that first slide, particularly particulates and oxides of nitrogen. Now the poorer, uh, the less educated, the more deprived people are, the more likely they are to be exposed to air pollution from motor traffic or indeed from any other source. Because if you can afford to live somewhere where the air is cleaner, you generally do. But perhaps more importantly, more deprived people are also more susceptible to the health impacts of pollution. Particulates and oxides of nitrogen can cause heart attacks and strokes, circulatory disease, asthma, and other respiratory disease, as well as exacerbating existing conditions. So poorer people who are more susceptible are also the people who are more exposed. The good thing is that if you can reduce air pollution, you can reduce inequalities. Injuries are another major impact of travel policies. And we showed that the variation in risk, not both for mortality, particularly mortality, varies much more by your age and your sex than it does by whether you're walking, cycling, or driving. And in this paper, my colleague Sean Scholes and others, uh, we showed that, um, as you might think, but with the evidence to back it up, drivers kill more other use road users than cyclists do. So we're all safer, particularly if young people uh, uh, cycle, not drive. 
Walking and cycling for travel has many, or indeed for leisure, has many advantages. It gives physical activity. It's more age independent than most other forms of transport. It's affordable. It can provide door-to-door -door access. Not only you don't adversely affect other people's air quality, but in fact, as you walk or cycle, you're exposed to lower concentrations of air pollution than you are inside vehicles. It's flexible, you're not dependent on other people's timetable. It's good for mental as well as physical health. People take less sick leave and have a longer life expectancy. Now we know from the Health Survey for England in 2016 that 34% of men and 42% of women in England were insufficiently active. And walking and cycling can provide the same health benefits as sport or other activity, physical activity. It can increase cardiorespiratory fitness. And working or cycling to work can be as effective as a training program and can fulfill the recommendations for physical activity. Physical activity reduces new cases or incidents and death, mortality from many conditions, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke, dementia, depression, osteoporosis, various can cancers, for example. In fact, many of these are also um, caused or exacerbated by air pollution. Now, obesity is a very large problem in more and more countries in the world. In the OECD countries, the paler lines are for women, the darker lines for men. There's the OECD average with 19.5% at the time of, of this chart, and UK down here with 27%. Pale blue are those with self-reported height and weight, and the dark blue is measurement. And you can see that UK is, is one of the worst countries for obesity and the countries here are, are the BRICS group. These figures are now slightly uh, out of date, so the, the figures are probably higher, and, and COVID would have uh, increased that as well. But obesity was causing around 9,000 premature deaths every year, with each of these people losing on average nine years of life, costing the NHS more than five billion pounds and wider society 20 billion pounds. Obesity continues to rise in England. Uh, the grey lines are obesity, and that from 1993-45 has increased from around over 15% to nearly 30%. And the blue lines show uh, the proportion of people who are obese or overweight. And for that, uh, men in the dark blue are higher than women. So more than 60% of men and women are obese or overweight. Diabetes, which is strongly related to obesity, has been rising for the last 25 years. Now this is doctor diagnosed diabetes. Some of the rise is because of greater diagnosis, but we also know from the health survey where we can take blood measurements that another about 2% of people have undiagnosed diabetes. So both are rising. Sorry. Uh, physical activity is a problem worldwide. Again, the UK is doing really well and being nearly top of the, the scale in insufficient activity. But you can see from, from this map that uh, many countries have very high levels of physical inactivity. But if you change how you travel, you can change your uh, body mass index, measure, which is a measure of obesity. So people in the UK who switched from traveling by car to walking, cycling, or public transport, their BMI fell. And those who switched in the opposite direction, their BMI rose. And if you look only at those who switched to active travel, it fell more. We also know from a study in Australia that uh, it's not just because people were walking instead of uh, their leisure activity, because uh, this, study in Australia showed that even if you looked only at people who did meet the physical activity requirements in their leisure time, those who commuted by car 
gained more weight than those who didn't commute by car. So there are many benefits of active transport. The immediate ones for individuals is increasing physical activity, but there are many benefits for population health and reducing inequalities, less reliance on motorised transport, and fewer of the other adverse impacts of motor vehicle use on other people, and improves equity and health and well-being of individuals, families, and communities. And there's the additional benefit by thinking of transport as moving people rather than planning for moving cars, that it releases a lot more space because instead of having 69 people in 40 cars or possibly 69 cars, you can have one bus, 69 bikes or 69 pedestrians and a lot more space for people to use for other things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof Mandel. And it's a subject that's really close to my heart. I work in uh, one of the parts of London that has both uh, some of the highest levels of deprivation and also the highest levels of air pollution. And as a result, the children in my area have 10% reduced lung capacity, which is horrific if you think about it. Um, you know, that we're living in one of the richest capitals in the world and that's still the case. Last but not, not least, I'd love to hand over to Dr. Geisha Hubner, who is our um, speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I will now, when I get, I will now speak about climate change and mental health. So we've heard a lot about climate change and how it might impact physical health and other impacts such as migration, displacement. And then I really want to focus on mental health. So what do I mean by mental health? I'm using the definition of the World Health Organization, which says that this is a state of well-being in which individuals realize their own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively, and are able to make a contribution to their community. What I like about this definition is that it's not just focused on mental health disorders, but also about this general aspect of well-being and doing well in your life. Again, citing the World Health Organization, there's no health without mental health. So we need to make mental health as much a priority as physical health. We also know that poor mental health is expensive. So some estimates put the wider economic costs of poor mental health and loss in productivity at 2.5 trillion US dollars. That was in 2010. This is projected to rise to 6 trillion in 2030. An estimate was at home from England stated that the um, costs of poor mental health are 100 billion pounds per year. So again, huge sums of money. So in, as much as I think that we need to quantify mental health in these monetary terms, I also really think we need to think about humans, about people. And again, citing the World Health Organization, the promotion, protection, and restoration of mental health has to be seen as a vital concern. And I would like to add as a moral responsibility for all of us. Okay, so after setting the scene a bit about mental health, what it is, why it's important, I will now look at some evidence what we know around mental health and climate change, saying that we actually know more about physical health. So I think most researchers so far on physical health, but we have some quite reliable insights into mental health as well. So let me start by speaking about heat waves and high temperatures, one of the most uh, well-known consequences of climate change. These have been linked to an increase in suicide rates, to an increase in hospital admissions for mental disorders, to an increase in violent crime, which then of course can have knock-on effects on mental health, and also to poorer sleep quality, which again has many knock-on effects, and uh, also, for example, being able to perform less well, to be less productive, and then potentially economic less losses, which again negatively impact on mental health. I want to pick up on the point around humility, because I think many of you might have seen the recent headlines around how rising humility could be linked to an increase in suicide. And this is, um, for example, a headline from the Guardian article, and the work is based on a paper that was just recently published. And Elan, from whom we've just heard, is one of the authors of this paper. So I hope he's okay with me picking this up. So, what they did is they used data from 60 countries. It was a very large study looking at many different countries 
and link, look at the links between humidity and heat waves and suicide rates. And we found that relative humidity was a more important factor than heat waves, which I think is really interesting because I think we tend to speak more about hot temperatures, but humidity seems to be an important, very important factor here as well. They also showed that women and the younger population were particularly affected. And then finally, I do want to point out that they showed a lot of variation in the estimates from different countries, which just shows that um, it's really important to look at the data and look at the science. Another area where we have quite a bit of evidence is around extreme weather events. So things such as flooding, wildfires, and, and violent storms. These have been linked to increase in depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and anxiety, but also substance abuse and suicide. These effects can be long lasting and they're particularly pronounced after repeated exposure. Someone's home, for example, has been flooded multiple times. And these effects have been observed here in the UK, but also many other countries, Bangladesh, Chile, South Korea, Thailand, just to name a few. I also want to pick up on the term of eco-anxiety, which I'm sure many are familiar with which is defined as a chronic fear of environmental doom, it's also called equal distress, and there are various related concepts. So this is not yet considered a diagnosable condition, but as I said, mental health is not just about disorders. It's particularly experienced by the younger population and it's on the rise. Um, just as an example, there was a survey done amongst child and youth psychiatrists in England, and more of them, more, more than half of them reported that they had seen younger patients with this extreme fear of environmental um, doom. So it's definitely a very important issue. It's an interesting one because to one extent we can say, well, it's a normal adaptive reaction. We are seeing huge environmental destruction and have a huge environmental threat. We're living in a climate crisis. So in a way it could just be the adaptive response. On the other hand, it can very much negatively impact our life. It can lead to stress, grief, anxiety, sleep disturbances, and so on. So on the next slide, I just give an um, overview about the potential pathways to mental health impacts. It's necessarily um, simplified, um, but just to give a bit of more of an idea about all the factors that are at play here. So climate change in the middle and so forth. I've spoken so far, I've spoken about the consequences of climate change, heat waves, high temperatures, fire, storms, and flood that have been directly linked to mental health outcomes. Of course, there are also many other pathways, for example, via physical health issues or via economic instability. So we know that both poor physical health, but also economic instability and poverty are then linked to mental health outcomes. Not that here below climate change, we have eco anxiety. So this is experience with people who have not necessarily experienced personally the direct consequence of climate change, but just the fact that there is climate change, that there is a climate crisis can lead to these um, feelings. Moving on to the left-hand side, the drivers of climate change that also Jenny just spoke about. So the burning of fossil fuels leads to air pollution, and there have been recent studies linking this burning of fossil fuels resulting in air pollution, for example, with depression, anxiety, psychosis, and dementia. Another driver of climate change, our diet. I think there's at the moment very, very little evidence whether there is any link to mental health. Um, outcomes, but some initial work on highly processed diets, which are bad for the climate, but also might have some mental health implications. Okay, so on my last slide, I just want to conclude with what needs to be done to bring mental health much more to the forefront of our discussions. So obviously, the most important thing we have to do is to stop climate change. It almost seems superfluous to say this, but we know that we need to tackle the root cause. We need to stop climate change. But we also know that this is incredibly difficult. We have just seen the long negotiations at COP26 and an agreement that many will say doesn't go far enough. And um, so we know that this is not, not an easy task, but we also know that even if we now stop emitting fossil fuels, because of all the greenhouse gases already in our atmosphere, we will see further warming. So what else do we need to do? Need to do? So I think we really need to build collaboration around this topic of mental health and climate change. We know climate change doesn't stop at borders. And of course, the same is true for the mental health impact here as well. I really think we need to focus on education. Um, first of all, because I think in general, we know less about uh, mental health. Climate change is not something I think people routinely think about and put in the calculations around climate change costs and benefits. 
but also because mental health is still stigmatized in many countries. And that makes it particularly hard to then speak about this topic and try to find solutions. Um, we also need to invest in infrastructure. We need good health infrastructure and also, also mental health infrastructure. And then finally, I do think we will need more data. We, there are many open questions related to this topic and we don't have enough evidence for some of the links and we don't have values attached to them, which also means um, I do think we need to see more research. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution. And what I really love from all of the panelists is actually the widespread that we have from across the university and from across the different schools. And the fact that climate change and health are really integrated across all of these different departments, hopefully together, I guess, this part of the aim of Generation One, we can collaboratively come up with uh, research solutions for, for what I consider to be the greatest challenges of our times. We have had some wonderful questions coming through on the Slido, and if you want to ask a question, you're still very much welcome to. Um, please head over to Slido, and uh, you can uh, join using the event code UCL Climate. And I'll start off with a question, which I guess uh, any one of the panelists can jump in. Um, and well, it's actually going to be three questions which are sort of related. Uh, so we have one question, which is, since climate change affects primarily the most vulnerable, are higher income nations relatively safe from climate change risks? And as, as a sort of continuation of that, um, how can uh, higher income or developed nations take responsibility and help address climate change problems that they might have primarily caused? Um, who wants to jump in? Elan. Ultimately, all of us are human beings. We all have vulnerabilities and ways of dealing with those vulnerabilities. So trying to say, well, you're more vulnerable, so you're more at risk actually doesn't make sense. We all have issues. And particularly if it gets to the point of heat humidity, which we're really at now, then all of us are affected similarly. The difference is what can we do about it? And maybe some of us can afford and are willing to stay indoor 24 seven with uh, air conditioning, even though that uses a lot of energy, many others aren't. But even if I can do that, number one, my food supply is going to be interrupted. Number two, the more people who emulate me, the more chance we have of power outages, which means that I'm going to experience the heat humidity. So all of us has to deal with it. All of us has to contribute. And that to me also means that the developing developed divide is actually artificial. There are communities in Northern Canada which have worse infrastructure than the informal settlements around Dhaka and Bangladesh. So the artificial divide of these different class of countries do not make sense. We're all on the same planet. We're all have, we all have contributed different aspects. Yeah, some more than others, no one's disputing that, but we also have different needs in that, for example, communities in Northern Canada need more energy for heating to survive than say people in the tropics and then tropics need more cooling. So rather than taking on board the old outdated concept of common but differentiated responsibilities, which is built into the international climate change negotiations, we all have to contribute. We all have to deal with it. And we are all human beings with vulnerabilities and ways of dealing with those. Marina? I'm trying to unmute myself. Am I muted? You're good. Yeah, we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I will absolutely agree with Ilan in everything he said, and perhaps emphasize that, well, that is um, a common uh, argument that was used by the negotiations for very long, and um, kind of the, the higher income countries felt relatively protected from climate change for a very long time. I think reality has shown us the opposite, and we have seen throughout this year uh, that just it's just finishing very big heat waves hitting the most uh, the, the richer countries in the world with Canada and the US uh, seeing enormous loss of life of very vulnerable populations within their communities um, suffering from those extreme heat waves we've seen uh, Germany as well with the flood events there and it's exposed how climate change really left, leaves no one untouched and also to echo what Ilan has said we 
particularly in, when we look at indigenous communities, there's so much knowledge on how to cope with health uh, hazards of climate change. And there's so much that we need to um, take from those communities and adapt it through, through our um, kind of through more uh, richer countries, that it's really um, not about whether there's more or less vulnerable populations. It's just about understanding where each of our vulnerabilities lies and understanding that no country around the world will ever be in touch from climate change. And to your question about kind of um, what is the responsibility, there are historical emitters that have contributed much more than others to, to climate change, but also today are in a position in which they are able to enjoy um, the transition to newer technologies and to develop a whole new area of their economies as a result of the transition to a low carbon energy system, and low carbon lifestyles. So there's a lot to be said there also about how we're enabling other countries um, to adopt those measures and to adapt their own cultures and their own knowledge to promote the transition within their um, communities and within their resources to a lower carbon economy and to enhance that knowledge transfer as well. Great, thank you. We've had some very um, direct questions in about uh, very specific measures that can be taken. Uh, Jenny, I think the first one might be for you. <laughs> um, and then we can open up to the others. So the first is, how can we encourage or persuade car users to consider other travel modes rather than automatically getting into their cars? And uh, just to chuck in a couple more there, does UCL have any plans to install solar panels? Um, and uh, can the aggregated buying power of healthcare providers be um, leveraged to, uh, uh, to use green electricity um, to accelerate our, our movement towards carbon zero? So I'm hitting you with a few sort of direct measures that could be taken today, Jenny. Okay, well, I, I don't know uh, about any plans that UCL has, but uh, hopefully somebody else does. I think it would be great. We've got an awful lot of roof space. Um, and although it's expensive, it will save money, particularly the rate that um, fuel prices are in, increases, it would probably save money in the not too distant future, as well as making a firm state statement and putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, as regards getting people out of cars, I mean, I think even if you got to the point that drivers think before driving, rather than just assuming I have a car, I will use it, uh, that would be an advantage and um, so it, it, there's a, probably a wide range of things that all need to be done so making it more expensive to drive but less expensive to travel by other modes for example uh, when you've paid your annual MOT and um, all the other the annual expenses you've got for a car and you've actually invested in owning one the marginal, the cost of driving is just the marginal cost, whereas if you're using public transport, it's the uh, average cost for each trip. So it's very, very expensive compared with using a car once you've bought it, bought a car. We need to um, have far more public transport and instead of uh, and change the language. So at the moment, the government invests in roads and talks about subsidising public transport. Once you bring in the externalities, all the costs to society from people's car use, actually it's the other way around. We're subsidizing car use and we should be investing in public transport, reversing beaching. If you're living in rural areas, it's another form of fuel poverty. You can't get to work uh, and to many of the other places you need to get to without using a car because there are no safe alternatives. So uh, we need to shift the balance and planning and funding needs to invert the, the hierarchy that's traditionally used. So pedestrians are at the top and single uh, occupancy cars are at the bottom of the, the planning and the funding hierarchy. Thank you, Geisha. Um, thank you. I just wanted to come in there with a personal reflection around um, intensive, um, about reducing car use. So I haven't had a car for 10 years. I live in Cambridge. I have two young children who I need to transport around the city. And I have an um, electric cargo bike, which is great. And it works really well within Cambridge. However, I more and more realize the limits. And I think a lot of this is around infrastructure. So it is about the lack of public transport, but it's also about purely where can I store my bike? 
The cars are allowed to park for free on the street. I'm not allowed to park my cargo bike on the street, so I have to put it on the sidewalk where I block the way for wheelchair users and anybody with a pushchair. I can't put it in my garden because I live in a terrace house with no access to the back, so I can't get it in there. And so I think a lot of this is really also just around the pure infrastructure. And I really think we need to dispromote car use and really give more space to other car users. Um, so just like a personal reflection on this one. Um, and, and like Jenny said, public transport is so important. Again, I, I, I can't take my daughter horse riding because there's no public transport to any horse riding places, which means I'm thinking we're getting a car even though I don't want to. About um, UCL, so UCL has a quite a, has a very developed net zero plan for how they want to reach net zero. I don't know the details. I don't know what they say about solar panels, but I'm sure it's somewhere on um, UCL's webpage, a very detailed plan of what they what they want to do in the next decades. Yes, absolutely. UCL has been using solar panels in some buildings, uh, investigating passive solar as well as active solar, but it's not just solar. As Geisha mentioned, it's net zero. And particularly when we used to go to the office and actually deal with people in person, with thousands of students and staff walking around campus, looking at footfall energy was very prominent. Can we generate electricity from people just walking on the floor. So this is UCL as a world leader saying, we're doing these things anyway. How can we generate electricity and get off grid? Thank you. I don't think we're going to have time to get to all of our questions, but uh, maybe as a wrap up from the panel, we've had a question which says, if you can implement five policies, and I'm not going to ask you for five, I'm going to ask you for one each, worldwide or nationally to combat the effects of climate change on health, what would they be? Um, and you know what, because they've asked for five, I'm going to give one as well, <laughs> which is going to be a little bit out there, but I think that we should have a shorter working week. Uh, I think that a shorter working week will mean that people um, spend more time in their communities and in their families, they can have more time to exercise, I'll have better mental health, they'll earn a little bit less, so they'll probably consume a little bit less. And perhaps there's going to be lots of knock on effects. Who knows? Ilan. That was a brilliant introduction and it segues directly into mine. My policy is do not isolate climate change. Climate change links to all these areas, not just health, as we've heard from you, Rita, and the other wonderful panelists, but all other topics. And so by embedding climate change, by placing climate change within these wider endeavor, endeavors for policy, we're actually going to tackle so many of the societal ills that we face together and move forward constructively, trying to help everyone and in effect use everyone to help ourselves through exchange, through exciting approaches and through simply building a better world, a better planet and a better society. So do not isolate climate change in any policy endeavor. Jenny? How about a 20 mile an hour speed limits on all residential and shopping streets and roads? Uh, across the UK and in any other countries that would like to follow suit. Marina, ah, Geisha. So wearing my, my hat as a buildings researcher, I think we need to improve our building stock. We need to insulate our buildings so that they don't get too cold in winter because we know cold temperature also bad weather at fast. We need to put in better shading so that they don't overheat in summer and we need to stop heating them with gas. So everything that we can do along those lines, I think needs to be a top priority for policy. And Marina, our final policy. Um, I would focus on the, on the medical community and on the health community that is where we work the most and ensure that in all communications from medical professionals, from GPs, we always have climate change as a health risk being communicated in the same way as we communicate against tobacco use and uh, we communicate for active travel. So communicating about the health risks of climate change and the health opportunities of that transition and including some climate prescriptions from doctors. Doctors uh, ensuring that when they speak to their patients and the nurses, when they speak to their patients, um, they do promote healthier diets that are also low carbon diets and they explicitly make that link. They promote healthier lifestyles with more physical activity and active travel rather than 
road use uh, with uh, fossil fuel um, based transportation, and that they make that link explicit as a health uh, promoting e exercise of decarbonizing our lifestyles. Thank you. Thank you to our audience for joining this uh, UCL Generation 1 session on health and climate change. How can tackling climate change improve your health? Our next Generation 1 lunch hour lecture is going to be taking place on Tuesday the 30th of November from 1 until 2 and the subject is what is the carbon footprint of your clothes? It just leaves me to thank our wonderful panellists Marina, Ilan, Jenny and Geisha and hope to see you at the next event. Thanks very much. Thank you.